Well, music can bring people together, and it can push them apart. Sarah Val learned this as a teenager growing up in Montana, where she was in marching band, band one, symphony band, jazz band, pep band, orchestra, and the Bozeman Recorder Ensemble. She told the story at a broadcast that This American Life did in front of a live audience in San Francisco. It was autumn in America, a fine, hot Indian summer day. Pretty high school girls sat on bleachers with the sun shining on their pretty hair, watching handsome high school boys play football. And then it was halftime, which is where I came in. I was standing in line in my silver spats down past the end zone waiting to go on. I was in 11th grade. I was in marching band. I had a foot-tall fake fur black hat with the vaguely processed food name Shaco strapped under my chin. <laughs> that not only prevented me from breathing, it prevented me from balancing so that even though my job was to march around as some kind of sick metaphor for teenage military precision, <laughs> I moved through time and space with the grace and confidence of a puppy walking on a beach ball. <laughs> because of my double shortage of strength and coordination, I barely passed gym, but somehow I was supposed to lift a baritone horn that measured twice my body weight, blow into it while reading microscopic sheet music, step in a straight line while remembering left foot on beats one and three, right foot on beats two and four, and maneuver myself into cute visual formations like the trio of stick figures when we played the theme from My Three Sons. <laughs> And then, halfway through the halftime program, I had to break formation, drop my baritone horn on the field, and sprint to the 50-yard line, a long haul, with everyone in the band, everyone in the bleachers, everyone on the sidelines, watching and waiting, silent and still. And then I picked up my mallets. This is what they had been waiting for, a xylophone solo on a little Latin-flavored number called Tico Tico. <laughs> My polo shirt-clad nemesis, Andy Heap, stood up in the stand screaming, Val! Val! Woo! Woo! <laughs> as the laughter of his friends at me drowned out the horn section. This was the same Andy Heap, I might add, who earlier in the week in music history class had delivered an oral report on Tchaikovsky's mistress and referred to her as Mimi throughout, even though her name was Nadia. Andy Heap... <laughs> Andy Heap was apparently smart enough to publicly humiliate me during Tico Tico. He just wasn't smart enough to know that the abbreviation MME period stands not for Mimi, but the title Madame. Anyway, I only had a second to stick out my tongue at Andy when I finished because I had to let go of the mallets, rush over to my baritone, again the freeze frame spectators, the loneliness of the long distance runner, <laughs> and I'm back in formation with the low brass for the finale. <laughs> and I was getting academic credit for this. I was getting graded, which begs the question, what exactly was I supposed to be learning? Marching is not a particularly applicable skill in later life. <laughs> and ditto all the other handy things music classes taught me. The E-flat minor scale, the alternate fingering for D-sharp. Here then, some of the lessons, actually useful ones, I accidentally learned while pursuing music. Accidental lesson number one, Marxism for 10th graders. Once a week, the best band kids played with the orchestra. I played the bass drum in orchestra, which meant that I never got to play. My participation ratio was something like 75 measures of rest per one big bass wallop, which gave me plenty of time to contemplate the class warfare of the situation. <laughs> and here's what I figured out. Orchestra kids wore tuxedos. Band kids wore tuxedo t-shirts. <laughs> And the orchestra kids with their brown woolens and Teutonic last names had the well-scrubbed dark blonde aura of a Hitler Youth Brigade. <laughs> These were the sons and daughters of humanities professors. They took German. They actually played soccer. 
Dumping the fluorescent t-shirts of the band kids into the orchestra each week must have looked like tossing a handful of Skittles into a bowl of Swiss chocolates. <laughs> but nothing brings kids together like hate. And the one thing and the one thing the band kids and the orchestra kids had in common was a unified disgust for the chorus kids who were to us merely drama geeks with access to four-part harmony. <laughs> a shy violin player wasn't likely to haunt the halls between classes playing Ina Klein and Nacht music any more than a band kid would blare Land of a Thousand Dances on his tuba more than three inches outside the band room door. But that didn't stop the choir girls from making everyone temporarily forget their locker combinations thanks to an impromptu, uncalled-for burst of Brigadoon. <laughs> Andy Heap, chorus. <laughs> Accidental discovery number two. Where's Walter? My junior high had an electronic music lab. We made tape loops and learned words like quadrophonic. In my spare time, you know, just for fun, I checked out all the books on electronic music from the library. My favorite records for a while there were Walter Carlos's concept album, Switched on Bach, and its sequel, The Well-Tempered Synthesizer, which offered what I thought were hilariously witty covers of Bach classics performed on, get this, a Moog synthesizer. <laughs> but in my readings on electronic music, something puzzled me. Every time I'd look into Walter Carlos, the information would just stop and someone named Wendy Carlos would turn up. I got to school early one morning to ask my electronic music teacher what happened to Walter and was Wendy Walter's wife or daughter? And my teacher kind of didn't answer for a long time and then he blurted out, uh, Wendy is Walter. <laughs> what did he mean? Uh, Walter, Walter had a sex change operation and changed his name to Wendy. What's a sex change operation? <laughs> now, I know it's hard to capture now, here in San Francisco. <laughs> what a shock this was. I knew absolutely nothing about sex. Um, we didn't talk about sex in my house and sex ed wasn't scheduled until spring. <laughs> That Walter Carlos, I hadn't even recovered from the shock that Bach could be messed with. <laughs> Number three, biology as destiny. In seventh grade, I started band. I wanted to play the drums. My parents, who lived with me, as was the custom in Montana, did not want me to play the drums. <laughs> So I picked the next loudest instrument, the trumpet. How I loved my trumpet, the feel of it in my hands, its very volume and shine. You know what I especially loved? The spit valve. <laughs> in eighth grade, a teacher told me about this good old trumpet player I might like, so I went out and bought one of his records. And every night for over a year, I went to sleep listening to it, the same songs over and over, trying to figure out why Louis Armstrong was so funny, so moving, so good. And I got caught up in this superstar talent of his right around the time I was beginning to suspect that I didn't have it. Talent, I mean. And there was another problem, too, which I discovered about three years into my trumpet career. I found out the reason I was getting a shoddy tone and I had trouble hitting the high notes was because of the shape of my jaw. The shape of my jaw. I felt the world was more or less over. I was outraged that a person's fate could depend on something as arbitrary as the angles of her teeth. And not only that, I had to switch to a brass instrument with a bigger mouthpiece, the baritone horn. The baritone horn, like trumpets are played by Miles Davis and baritones are played by nobody. 